Praise the Lord. All right, so up as we we'll pray together. Thank you very much. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer. That the Bible story tonight will open your eyes of understanding. That this important subject, that the Lord himself will throw light on it in your heart. Or correct erroneous views, erroneous conception concerning this subject. And it will show us the power of our relationship with him. And what he calls us to. So that as we do this, we'll see the privilege that the Lord has granted to New Testament believers. And ours will be the great blessing that He showers upon our lives. Pray that the Lord will keep you awake, be at alert. You'll not sleep, neither will you toss the word of God aside. But the word will transform our lives and not leave us at the place it found us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name tonight for our Bible study. We bless your name because of all those who are gathered here, all those who are gathered in this city of Lagos, all those who are gathered all over Nigeria, all over Africa and beyond. Lord, we pray tonight, you teach us your word yourself in Jesus' name. And we're praying that this importance as well as sensitive subject, you'll teach us in a balanced way in Jesus' name. That this word will enrich our lives will turn us around that all the errors anybody has been holding that should kick away and blot out all those errors and give us your truth in jesus name help us lord to accept and receive your word and then to make it practical workable in our lives and the principles to show us will stand on those principles live our lives not on what people say not on what religious people say, but on what you have inspired in the word and what you are teaching us. And confirm the word in every heart tonight. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can see now. We're back to Matthew chapter 6. As you know, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. For such a long time now. And now we come to this important subject. Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 16. Open your Bible with me. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. As you look at those verses of scripture, they form the foundation for the study of this important subject. It's a subject of praying and fasting. As you think about prayer and fasting, you will understand that praying and fasting is not peculiar to the Christian people. Other religious people too fast. Other religious people too, they pray. And at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, and he had his earthly ministry, fasting and praying, or praying and fasting, they were not peculiar to the believers. The religious people too, they prayed quite a lot, and they fasted quite a lot. The Pharisees in particular, the religious people of the day, they fasted. But then, you know what the Lord has been correcting? He's been correcting the wrong attitude and the wrong way in which those people prayed and in which those people fasted. 
But lest his correction should be taken for denial. Lest his correction should be taken to mean that then the believers don't have to pray. And the believers don't have to fast. That's why he said we're taking away the error and we're establishing the truth. That's what Jesus has been doing. And if you look at what he said in verse 16. He says, moreover when ye fast. Well, you understand the first word moreover. When well, you're speaking normally in English language, there are some words you don't start uh, your sentence with. If you are starting, for example, you pick up a book, and then the very first chapter and the very first word of the very first paragraph, you see, moreover, you say, what, what are we talking about? Moreover. It means the author must have said something before, and now because of what he has said, he now says, above and beyond what I said before. Moreover, more over what had been said and so when you see that word moreover you're thinking you're asking yourself what was it has been talking about number one it's been talking about the good deeds of the people it's been talking about arms giving and then when he said about arms given he said when you do your arms giving and then he talked about prayer and he said when you pray which means then it's expecting that believers will do good deeds believers will give alms believers will help the poor not only that the believers will pray and when he said moreover when he prays says just like i said on good deeds just like I said in prayer, moreover, this is another religious duty. This is under Christian expectation that you will fast. And then it says, when ye fast. Have you noticed something? He said, when. If the Lord had said, if, then it will be doubtful. It will mean, if you fast, if you don't fast. But he used the word when, which means that it's taken for granted that in your Christian life, in your Christian devotion, in your Christian commitment, in your Christian consecration to the Lord, in your worship of the Lord, the time will come in your life when you will fast. Now when you do fast, here is what you are to take note of. It tells us in verse 16 that be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. It means don't publicize it. Don't try to win the attention of people. I don't try to make people feel see me. I'm fasting. And see me. I've been fasting now for this number of days. Try to just build up yourself before people. He said that's the one thing you must not do. When ye fast, be not as the hypocrites sir, For they disfigure their faces. That they may appear unto men to fast. And he says when you fast in that way. And you publicize that fasting. He says I say unto you. They have their reward the lord was very concerned that whatever we do we must not be as the hypocrites are the practice of hypocrites actually had rendered everything they did the arms given the praying the fasting unacceptable unto god they miss the promised reward of arms giving not only that number two they miss the divine response to their prayer number three they miss the supernatural power of fasting because of the hypocrisy and their superstition you know they, they thought that you know if we can just fast a number of days we can twist the arms of god and we can make him to do what he's not willing to do but the lord jesus has been teaching us over and over again he says god is our father you are born again you're a child of god you've turned away from your sin you've received jesus as your personal savior your name is in the book of life you're a member of the family of god and it says look at god as your father that you don't have to do this and do this and do that before you can have what he has promised and when you have to fast your fasting will face you are fasting with the understanding that God has promised and God is going to fulfill you see the pharisees never looked at God as father those religious people they never looked at God as father even today many people who say they pray and many people say they fast they don't look at God as father to them is a great creator a mighty God a powerful God and a great judge and every time they come before the Lord, they feel guilty. And they're expressing their guilt and their condemnation. They had not been living as they ought to live. And then you'll find that you know sin, the two must sin conscious. And because of not having that concept as God, as Father. 
then they think the fasting is something they will do so that they can change the mind of a reluctant God who is not willing to bless people and then you have to go on hunger strike and really fast before the Lord will answer the prayer but the Lord is saying change that attitude change that superstition look at all the almighty god as a father and your father in heaven knows what you need and he wants to answer your prayer he will answer your prayer the practice of those hypocrites that is doing a good thing with wrong motives should not make the true believers to abandon something scriptural something profitable and something powerful it's it's a privilege the lord has given us and we shouldn't say because the unbelievers are doing it wrong then we don't do it at all can i tell you something there are some religious people of all i even want to say there are some christian people evangelical pentecostal people they say a lot of the other religious people they do it wrong the white garment churches they're doing it wrong and all those historic churches that do not know about being born again they're fasting and fasting and they're doing it wrong and then they say they don't want anything to do with fasting we shouldn't take that attitude that all the people have done good things with wrong motives does not mean that we cannot do the same thing with right motives fasting when you join into a prayer and faith in god can really mean great things can do great things in your life and it has been the practice of god's people in solemn moments and in sorrowful periods in their lives in times of personal crisis in times of national calamity god's people have always sought supernatural help and divine intervention through prayer and fasting and whenever this has been done with a heart that only leans on god fully leans of go on god completely leans upon the lord and fully trusts in him he has always responded favorably that's why the lord himself has said over and over your father who sees in secret will reward you openly look at that chapter 6 of matthew and look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says but thou when thou doest arms again not he but when let let not thy right hand know what thy your left hand know what thy right hand doeth verse 4 that thine arms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall do what shall reward thee openly we're told in verse 6 but thou when thou prayest enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. And then he tells us in verse 17, verse 18, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which seeth, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. I'm given. When you do it secretly, he'll reward you openly. In praying, when you do it secretly, he'll reward you openly. And then fasting as well. When you do that secretly, he will reward you openly. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the practice of purposeful fasting. Are you underlined the word purposeful? Purposeful. The practice of purposeful fasting. Number two, the portrayal of pretentious fasting. That word portrayal just means the picture. The picture of pretentious fasting. Number three, the power of proper fasting. Number one is the practice of purposeful fasting. Number two, the portrayal, the picture of pretentious fasting. And then number three, the power of proper fasting. Let's come back to number one. The practice of purposeful fasting it says in matthew chapter 6 verse 16 moreover when ye fast stop right there moreover the lord jesus christ said when ye fast and when jesus said that actually we have the history of the people of god waiting upon the lord and fasting behind us and as you look at the old testament from the 
uh, from the beginning of times from genesis all through to the time when the children of israel settled in the land of canaan and to the time of the kings and the time of the prophets the people actually practiced fasting but you're going to find out something it was purposeful they had a reason they had a goal they had a desire they had something they wanted to have and because they felt they couldn't have those things just ordinarily like that that's why they committed themselves to that time of waiting upon the lord i want to show you in second chronicles chapter 20 second chronicles chapter 20 as we look at these examples of fasting in scripture we learn quite a lot on believers fasting you'll find that individuals fasted in the old testament as well as in the new testament as then you also find groups of people fasted at special times and those were times of exceptional gravity or danger when they when they found themselves under some heavy bodies from which they need to be free maybe in your personal life you find there are some heavy bodies some yoke some difficulties some challenges and you are praying and the sin has not gone and you have done everything you could do but the thing has not gone and then you say i think i need to spend quality time in the presence of the lord waiting upon the lord so that i fast and pray until this burden is rolled away it will be rolled away and the yoke is broken it will be broken and all those challenges by the grace of god god will bring solution to them in jesus name some fasting was of uh, some such fasting was often an expression of deep humiliation before the Lord, a demonstration of utter helplessness, a cry of absolute dependence upon the Lord. Such fasting was not a response to any command from the Lord. The Lord did not command many of the fasting. It's just that the people felt the need the cry of their soul the burden upon their lives the challenges they had and it was those it was a challenge that actually led them and pushed them and drew them into those periods of mourning and humiliation and humility before the lord and fasting it was a voluntary spontaneous act of seeking god's help when they were overwhelmed by serious perplexing problems and let's look at a few of them in second chronicles chapter 20 I'm reading to you from verse 1. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and, and with them of the other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Azazantama, which is Sengedai. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. He was afraid a great problem had come upon him as a king in the nation and the, and the and the problem also affected the whole nation and he knew the outcome of that battle will deter he, he might even lose his life and because of the fear because of the anxiety that he had and because of the body because of the challenge because of the unresolved problem that he had he felt i need to seek the face of the lord in prayer and fasting i were told that he feared he set himself to seek the lord and he proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. In verse 4, we're told, and all Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. As we look at this in particular, what do you find out here? You know, there are people that they just fast and pray and they do not understand there are some things that come as components of that fasting and praying they do not understand there are some things in your own personal life that come as a result of what you're doing that you need to put in place so that the lord will answer the prayer this example of praying and fasting what do you see here number one you'll see faith number one faith and let's look at verse six and said oh lord god this is a prayer I was praying and you'll see there's a prayer of faith you see if you're fasting and there's no faith there'll be no answer to the prayer if you're fasting and you're not trusting in the in the power of the lord there'll be no answer to the prayer and the fasting 
If you're fussing and your heart is filled with confusion and doubt and you're not standing upon the unchanging, infallible word of God, there'll be no response from heaven. The number one thing you see in this fasting here is faith and said, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are thou not God in heaven? And rulest not thou all over the over all the kingdoms of the heathen, and in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. He said, We're praying unto you, we're calling upon you, and we're waiting upon you because we know nobody can withstand you. Those who are mightier than us, they are not they are, they are not a kind of as my, mighty enough for you not to overcome. Are you not the ruler of all over the earth? Are you not the governor of the whole earth? Will you not help us and destroy all these evil things? Yes, he will. You must have faith when you're fast. Number two is humility. Humility. Look at verse 12. Oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. That's humility. When you come before the Lord, if you come like a Pharisee, so proud, so haughty, so pompous, oh Lord, look at me. I'm waiting upon you. And you know, Lord, I give tithes of all I have. And I do this and I do that. And you come with pride. The fasting will mean nothing. Number one, you need faith when you fast. Number two, you need humility when you fast. Number three, unity. Unity. In verse 13. And all Judah stood before the Lord. With their little ones, their wives and their children. Unity. Unity in the family. You know, you're fasting. Maybe you're the husband in the family. And you have anything to settle with your, with your wife? Settle that and be united before you go into in the fasting. Or maybe you are the wife. You have a body. You have a yoke. You want to be broken. And then you have quite a lot of things against members of the family. Settle down and unite force. Don't you remember what Jesus said when you bring your gift to the altar? And there you remember that somebody has sought against you. Leave your gift at the altar and reconcile with your brother. Let there be unity. Maybe in the church. Want to fast and pray. And then you know that your mind, you're not the same. You don't have the same mind or the leadership in the church. Something that happened before, and you're still carrying that about in your heart. Animosity and malice, disunity and discord. And then you have all that in your heart. And so you're waiting upon the Lord. It's a waste of time. There must be unity. Unity among the people of God. Don't you know they prayed Jesus, prayed the Lord, that they all may be one. And it's when you have that unity, then you can go ahead with the prayer. Number four is spiritual receptivity. Spiritual receptivity. While you are praying and fasting, the Lord will reveal his mind to you as to this and this and that. You're not just going to continue the fasting and then not be receptive. Look at verse 15. And he said, Hacking. Hacking ye all Judah. That, that word hacking means listen. Listen. And you know, it's not just that you are not eating. Yes, thank God you're able to discipline yourself when you're fasting. But it says, Hacking ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, thou king and thou king Je Je Jehoshaphat, thus, thus says the Lord unto you. Be not afraid, not dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. It says, uh, you know, if you go through all this and you fast in the right way, the problem is out of your spiritual receptivity. Then, number five, obedience. Obedience. The Lord has been talking to you, and has been, this is what you do, and this is where you go in the time of fasting. By the way, this is the reason why many people that they fast quite a lot, and they don't see they don't see answers to their prayers because all these things are missing. All they think about fasting is, I didn't take my break fast. You understand that word now? Break fast. It's like, you know, fast. When you eat, you are breaking the fast. Break fast. I didn't take breakfast. I didn't take lunch. I've been waiting upon the Lord. And they don't understand why they fast so much. And there's no answer. There must be obedience to the word of God. As the Lord shown you light on something. As he shown you something that is missing out in your life. As he shown you something that, you know, he's been talking to you on this and this and that. And you have not been obeying the Lord. 
obedience will help you. Look at verse 18. In verse 18 and then verse 20. And Joshua bowed his head and with his face to the ground. And all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. Verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Joshua stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe the Lord your God. And so shall ye be established, believe his prophet, and so shall ye prosper. You know what the king was saying? He said, I'm king, but you know, the, the prophet has a word directly from the Lord. And when the prophet is standing and is bringing a word from the Lord, is greater and taller and higher than the king. Greater, higher, taller than the king. And you know that many of the kings of Israel they just had administration and they just ruled the people but when God wanted to bring his word to the people he, he sent a prophet and here was a king it was a king that kind of proclaimed the fast it was a king that brought them together and here showed up a prophet and told them hear me O Judah here is the word of the Lord and then Jehoshaphat bowed down to the word of the prophet when you are not just standing as king as lord of your life and then the word of the lord the word of the lord has come through the prophet and he says this is what you do obedience bowing down submitting putting yourself in subjection to that word of the lord from the prophet that is what is going to bring the answer to the prayer and to the fast and then number six is praise and worship praise and worship and you see what joshua did and this is still faith this is still faith he counted the work done he counted the battle over he counted the victory won and because of that here is what he did in verse 18 in verse 18 and verse 19 this is second chronicles chapter 20 verse 18 and joshua bowed his head with his face to the ground and all judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the lord worshiping the Lord worshiping the Lord in verse 19 and the Levites of the children of the Kohites and of the children of the Kohites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high and then number seven counsel number seven counsel and you know there are people that fast and then they don't listen to anybody they don't accept any counseling. They don't, they don't accept any advice. Oh, they say I'm fasting. And they think that the fasting all, in, all alone by itself makes them above teaching of the word of God, above the doctrine of the Bible. The fasting in itself makes them to come above counseling. But you look at this same chapter and we're looking at verse 21. It says in verse 21, and when he had consulted, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. He consulted with the people. Hey, do you see why many people fast and there's no result to their fasting? There's no response from heaven to their fasting. There's no answer to their prayer. But you see, when you have number one, faith, number two, humility, number three, unity, number four, spiritual receptivity, number five, obedience, number six, praise and worship, number seven, counsel, counsel. And you need to be counsel on something. He consulted with the people. And they were told, they appointed singing as your praise, the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth, endureth forever. I'm talking... I'm going to read some verses to you on this counseling I spoke about in Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12, very important in your life. That you don't think that an isolated believer, I know how to pray, that's not enough. I know how to fast, that's not enough. You need counseling. You need advice. You need direction. You need teaching. So that the word of the Lord will be able to put things straight in your life. And then the fasting becomes meaningful. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 12 verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that acts unto counsel is wise. Joseph had consulted with the people. And then they went into this uh, worshiping the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 11 verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. They may pray. If there's no counsel, what are they going to do? They may fast. If there's no counsel, what are they going to do? 
If you're holding some erroneous views in your mind, in your heart, in your life, and then you're just fasting, and there's no counsel. It says where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I'm looking at the Proverbs chapter, chapter 13, verse 10. Proverbs 13, verse 10. Only by pride comes contention, but what the well-advised is wisdom. Are you fasting? And then there's still confusion in your mind concerning what do I do in this area? What do I do in this area? Seek counseling from those who know the ways of the Lord, the words of the Lord, and the works of the Lord more than you do. Because it is pride that makes us to feel I'm an island by myself. I can take care of myself. I don't need anybody's counseling, anybody's instruction. Only by pride comes contention. But for the well advised, there is wisdom. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. 15, 22. It says, without counsel, purposes are, are, are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they, they are established. Proverbs chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 18. Proverbs 20, verse 18. Every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. Uh, have you understood now the, the case of Joshua? There was battle, there was war, there was conflict. And then he waited upon the Lord and fasted. What if when the prophet came and spoke to him, he said, don't waste my time, don't disturb me, I'm fasting, I'm waiting upon the Lord. I don't want to listen to anything now. No Bible study, no counseling, no advice, and no teaching, no exhortation. All I'm doing is waiting upon the Lord. It's more than that. It's more than that. And thank God, Jehoshaphat knew the secret of winning the victory. I'm passing the secret unto you. You'll win the victory in Jesus' name. It says over there, every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. And let's look at Ezra chapter 8. Ezra chapter 8, we're looking at examples of the people that fasted. And these people that fasted, they had a purpose, they had a goal, they had the reason for fasting. You don't just wake up in the morning and, you know, just say, today I want to fast. What's the reason? What do you have in mind? What's the goal? What's the desire? And what are you going to achieve? There must be a purpose to the fasting. Ezra chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 21. In Ezra chapter 8 verse 21. Here is the word of the Lord for us. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of ha uh, heaven. That we might afflict our souls before our God. To seek of him a right way for us. That's the purpose. That's the purpose, to seek the right way. What direction do I take? What decision do I make? Am I going to go safe and uh, without any harm to the place I'm going? It's, and then it says, and for little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, for this a purpose, a goal, a reason for the fasting and he was entreated of us. I pray the Lord will answer our prayer. In the case of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1 Nehemiah was uh, well settled in the palace. He was a cup bearer of the king and was receiving all those ambassadors coming uh, coming to the king and going away from the king and then he had uh, something about the city about the place he came from and he saw that the gates were broken down and the walls were destroyed and the city was burnt with fire he had a body in his heart and how was he going to take excuse from the king so that he'll be able to go to the land of his nativity and build up the walls and build up the gate and then build up the city again. That's why I waited upon the Lord in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4. Nehemiah chapter 1. And let's read from verse 2. That Ananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and asked, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant 
remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in a great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This wasn't a personal problem. This was a kind of a religious problem. And it was concerned that the covenant people of God, they had no place. That the promise of God was not yes and amen in their lives anymore. And that the city, the great city of the great king had been broken down. And the enemies were overriding, overrunning them. And he said, how can this be? The promise that we will be heard and will not be till have been withdrawn from us. And there is nobody that knows how long this will be except somebody will rise up and get something done. Because of that, he fasted and prayed and mourned and wept. And then he waited upon the Lord. That's the reason why people fast. That's the reason we ought to fast. In Esther, I'm reading from chapter 4. Esther chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. The practice of purposeful fasting. As Esther chapter 4 verse 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was not Mordecai, rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and, it, and came even before the king's gate for, but for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth and in every province whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay sackcloth and ashes and the problem here is Haman had decided he was going to destroy all the Jews a man said, I will destroy all the Jews. You understand the implication of that? All the Jews will be, they will be put out of existence. Number one, the implication is that the promise God had made to Abraham, that I'll bless the whole of the world through you, Abraham, I will not be fulfilled. If all the Jews were destroyed, if all the Jews were killed, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that he'll be the God, the living God, how will the world recognize that this is still the living God when all his people are destroyed? Not only that, he had given Abraham this land and given them also uh, unto the people. That is the people, the Jews, the poor of Abraham. And if all these Jews were destroyed, what will be their lot? That's what Mordecai thought about, but it's still one point. Jesus was to come through the Jews for the salvation of the whole world. And now Haman decided he was going to destroy all the Jews. When you hear the word Haman, Haman, Satan. Satan, Haman, Haman, Satan. Don't they look alike? I said, don't they look alike? Haman was actually a kind of an adversary to the people of God. Satan is an adversary to the people of God. And if Satan will have his way, he will want all the Jews to be destroyed so that Jesus Christ will not come. But that's, that's what uh, it, this Mordecai thought about. What will become for the salvation of the world? If Haman was to carry out his intention because of that, Mordecai left everything. And all the Jews left everything. Because they wanted now the preservation of the nation. So that the purpose of God for Israel... And for the whole world will be fulfilled. That's why they fasted. There is a purpose. If you're going to fast, if you're going to pray and fast, you must define the purpose. What's the purpose? The glory of God. What's the purpose? The salvation of humanity. What's the purpose? And the taking away of the problem, the challenge that you have. So that you can be released to serve the Lord without fear and without any kind of a problem, any hindrance. And then eventually we're told in verse 15, and then Esther bade them return. Mordecai this answer. Because Mordecai had sent to Esther and had said, do something about this. And tell the king about this problem. And don't hide your identity. Now you must come out and save the nation, the people of Israel, at this time, the Jews. And then Esther said, I can do nothing about this because the law of the land does not permit. And then Mordecai sent to her and said, if you keep quiet at this time, 
God will raise up deliverance from another source, but you and your father's house will be destroyed. That's why now Esther responded and said, Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. And fast ye for me. Now you know there's a purpose for that. And it says, And neither eat nor drink three days or night, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. If I perish, I perish. If I perish, tell me out loud. Say that again. If I perish, I perish. And let's think about this for some time you know the work of the lord there's some people that take care of themselves so much and they're too careful and they say i'm so young i don't want to have any problem i, I don't want to have hypertension there are some people the lord is calling you to uh, to minister maybe to lead in the house fellowship or to lead in a zone or to lead in a district but you've seen some challenges when you were working for the lord before and now you say i don't want to go through that again i don't want to go through that again i had some sleepless nights when i was doing that and now that i've withdrawn from the work of the lord i think it's okay for me i don't want to die but you know I said if I perish I perish if I perish saving the whole of the nation of Israel if I perish so I can preserve the nation the Jews for the coming of Christ if I perish if that will bring Christ through the lineage of David and the lineage of Abraham and then there will be the salvation of the whole world that's alright for me if I perish I perish did she perish? no if you lose your life and you're willing to lose your life for the glory of God, for the expansion of the kingdom of God and the gospel, then you'll save that life. If you're kind of holding on to that life and saving that life and guarding that life and protecting that life, I don't want to perish. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to, you know, have all, anything to do with all these things. Church work is too much and church problem too much. And those uh, people you know, who are into ministry, they have a potential. I don't want to have a, I don't want to die. It's when you give your life and just hand it over to the Lord and say, If I perish, I perish. And you're willing to pray and fast. If need be, then I'm sure you will not perish. And then through you, salvation, deliverance will come to thousands and millions of people in Jesus' name. Well, before I leave that uh, point, uh, the practice of scriptural fasting, let's go back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. We're looking at Joshua chapter 7. What had happened here is that there's a greater victory in chapter 6. You know the story that he is uh, in Jericho. They, they just, uh, with all those walls just came down. And then they were to go to a smaller city, Ai. And as they were going there, you know, Joshua was advised, Joshua was counseled. And once again, counseling is wonderful. But let the counseling come from the inspiration that God is giving. Let the counseling come from the people that know the mind of God. Let the counseling come from the people that are filled with the Spirit of God. We're talking about counseling. It's not just that you know, every dick and Harry will stand up and say, This is my opinion. Your opinion can bring God's real problem and defeat. And you know, there are some people that uh, uh, they think, uh, you know, the pastor needs a uh, counseling. I think you, you need to be more careful writing anonymous letters to the pastor and writing this and writing that. And you don't know head or tail of what you are writing about. Something has happened in the region and the pastor, the general sprinter, has taken his turn and he has said, this is it. This is what we are going to do. And before you know head or tail of the problem, you are writing a letter, anonymous letter to the general superintendent and uh, pastor, let me counsel you. Let me talk to you about this decision you are taking. Uh, you know, don't, uh, uh, you should be fearful. You should be little, you give some honor to leadership. Don't be that flippant and so quick in writing. You can enjoy yourself and enjoy the church. And so some people came and they said, Joshua, can we counsel you? And Joshua, you know what I'm talking about. And I said, yes, what do you counsel? Just send a few people there. And if you send a few people there, everything will be all right. That's what Joshua did. And then they, they had a kind of defeat that he never expected. Joshua chapter 7, I'm reading to you now. In Joshua chapter 7, it says so. 
Verse 4. They went up thither of the people about 3,000 men. And they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them about, smote of them about 36 men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim. And smote them in the going down, and wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And now we have the fasting in verse 6, and Joshua rent his clothes, and he, and, he, and he fell on the earth to the earth, bef upon his face, be before the ark of the Lord, until the evening. It was just one day fasting. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God. And once again, let me point to you that what the, what the uh, prayer here, you, you find quite a lot of things too associated with the fasting. Number one, humility. Humility. He fell on his face before the Lord. He was not arrogant. It was not a kind of proud, haughty before the Lord in our fasting. There must be that humility. They even demonstrated that humility by putting dust on their head. Number two, you will find prayer that you find in verse 7. Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought these people over Jordan? To deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. To destroy us, would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. And then he goes on in verse 8, O oh Lord, what shall I what shall I say? When Israel turneth their backs before their enemies. And then number three, you'll find the glory of God. God's glory. Number one, you have humility manifested during this fasting. Then number two, you find prayer. You know, it's not just not just fasting, it's prayer and fasting. There must be praying. You must have some requests to ask in the Lord during that time of fasting. And then number three, there's God's glory. God's glory. The reason you are praying and the reason you are fasting is because of God's glory. You're not seeking glory for yourself, exaltation for yourself, success just for yourself, success just for success. No. You want to have that success. You want to have that victory. You want to come because of the glory of God. That must be the uh, that must be the foundation of what you are looking for. Look at verse nine. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And then and watch will thou do unto thy great name. Joshua said, "This is my concern. This one fasting. If if we." are defeated and there is no victory oh lord i'm just wondering what will you do unto your great name and then number four reprove accepted reprove accepted as was praying and calling upon the lord then we read in verse 10 and the lord said unto joshua get thee up wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their corset sin and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put each even among their own stall. But you accepted that. He didn't argue with God. He didn't say, but what if somebody, just one person, had done something wrong? What's, what's my concern with that? We're talking about a whole nation. Reprove, accepted. When you are fasting, and then a correction comes, a reproof comes, the fasting will mean nothing if you do not accept the reproof. If the reproof is coming from the Lord, the chastisement is coming from the Lord, and the correction is coming from the Lord, it is then that will make the Lord to look at what you're doing and then you'll be accepted. Number five, searching and separation from sin. You search out the sin. Lord, what are you telling me? Lord, in which way have I gone wrong? It's not just praying and fasting. Uh, there must be the searching out of what is wrong. If uh, there's something in your life, something in your attitude, something in your character, something in your worship, something in your interaction with other people, something in your relationship with the Lord that has gone wrong, and you're just fasting and fasting and fasting, there must be the searching out to find out what is wrong. And then you separate from that thing. Look at verse 13. Of oh, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves. It 
against tomorrow. For thus the Lord God, uh, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, and thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come uh, according to the family, to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man, and it shall be that he that is taken from uh, with the accursed sin shall be born to a fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has wrought fully in Israel. So they sought out who has done the thing. Number five or number six now is obedience. Obedience. The Lord told him what to do. When you are fasting, and the Lord said, Can you put this right? Can you turn this sin around there? Can you stop that kind of activity? Can you apologize to so and so? Can you make right your life, your relationship with so and so, and just keep on fasting? And then you say, I'm, I'm fasting now. This is not the time for restoration, restitution. This is not the time for repentance. This is not the time to correct anything. I'm fasting now. The fasting will mean nothing. That will be like a Pharisee fasting. God will not pay attention. But it is when obedience comes, prompt obedience instant obedience at that time that's when the lord will hear look at verse 16 it says so joshua rose up early in the morning and brought israel by their tribes and the tribe of judah was taken and now number seven number seven impartiality impartiality uh, you know but when god revealed this to this to joshua and then Joshua rose up and then he said, yes, we're going to fish it out. We're going to find it out. We're going to search it out. And whoever is if what this is what God has said, sin must be dealt with. The fellow who was taking that accursed sin must be dealt with. And it says the tribe of Judah was taken. Joshua, what are you going to do? Maybe you don't understand about the tribe of Judah. When the twelve spies went to the land of Canaan to search out the sin in Numbers chapter 13, twelve of them were chosen. There were two of them that was that said, Yes, we can move on, we can go into the sea, we can go into that place, and we're going to overcome. And the ten spies said, No, we cannot. Do you remember the two people that said, Let's go, we can make it, we can go, we can get the land? Who are the two people? Tell me out loud. Joshua and Caleb. Now they became tight brothers, friends, very close together. And would you know, Caleb came from the tribe of Judah. Caleb came from the tribe of Judah. And Caleb will be the closest person to Joshua. Because they have been together all these 45 years. And I've been so faithful to the Lord. They were like partners. In fact, it was the humility of Caleb that made him to just submit to the leadership of Joshua. Because everybody would have thought, if anybody is going to take over from Moses, why not Caleb? Because this was a faithful man, a good man from the tribe of Judah. Let me show you. You need to mark this in your Bible in Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. In Numbers chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 6. Numbers 13, verse 6. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephone. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephone. Now, God said, deal with sin. You are fasting. And you want me to answer your prayer? You must take the accursed sin away. Get all the tribes together. And then the tribe of Judah was chosen. And then eventually it came to Achan. But you see the impartiality in Joshua. Although this person coming from the tribe of Joshua. Uh, sorry, from the tribe of Judah. Why have you done this? And he even said, tell me, my son, what you have done. My son. Are you the fellow? You are my son. 
how I appreciate your tribe. And anybody from your tribe, it's like there's a personal relationship. But this is what you have done. We must deal with it. That impartiality in the church, that impartiality in the leadership, you know, you're a leader, you're an overseer, you're fasting. I'm asking you, are you impartial in dealing with sin in the church? Or you are a pastor, are you impartial in dealing with sin in the church? Is that impartiality that actually makes us to, uh, to be the favorites of God? If God has favorites, and then you'll be able to say, Lord, I've done everything you've said. Even though the fellow is coming from the tribe of Judah, we're dealing with it. First Timothy chapter 5. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 5. You're dealing, you should deal with everything in the church without partiality. That's when by fasting and praying will have any meaning, any significance at all. In First Timothy chapter 5, we're looking at verse 20. Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Them that sin, somebody has done evil, somebody has committed sin. Deal with it. And then it says in verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, not doing nothing by what? Tell me out loud. Leaders in the church, coordinators, group coordinators, overseers, whoever we are, when you come to deal with sin or against sin, that you do everything without any partiality, that you are not saying, ah, ah, brother, why did you do this now? And you know how much I love you. I hope other people have not heard about this terrible thing you've done. If it were another person, this is what I would have done. But see what you've done now. All right, don't do that again. If you fast, you are wasting your time. If you're praying and fasting, you're wasting your time. Because you see, there's partiality in your leadership. But it is when you come before the Lord and you're able to say, this is how you have lived your life. There's no partiality at all. And the Lord will bless you and bless your ministry in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. amen. And you know, sometimes when you give your amen as if you've gone to sleep, I wonder what's happening to you. I said, the Lord will bless our ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. I come to point number two, the picture, the portrayal of pretentious fasting. The picture or the portrayal of pretentious fasting. And we'll, we'll go quickly on this. We need, to, we need to be very thorough on the practice of fasting. And then the things that come along with fasting. So that you'll be able to have, you know, the, the right direction you ought to go in our praying and fasting. The portrayal, the picture of pretentious fasting. In Matthew chapter 6, we're reading verse 16 again. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. That means, that's all the reward they will get. The reward of the Pharisee and the reward of the Sadducee. That's all they'll get. The reward of religious people that don't have any relationship with God. That's all they will get. The, the reward of the people that don't have the glory of God in mind. That's all the reward they will get. And they're not going to get anything from the Lord. Nothing from the Lord. When you fast, you must make your fasting to be unto the Lord if you want the Lord to answer your prayer. In Luke chapter 18, I'm reading from verses 11 and 12. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Underline those words, with himself. That's how he prayed. He was so conscious of himself. He was so filled with himself. He was so exalted in his own, in his own eyes. It's, it's as, you know, I'm the greatest fellow in the community, in the whole land. Is the, is the greatest appreciated, the most appreciated religious person in the whole land. He said, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners and unjust and adulterers. And even as this publican, I fast twice in the week. Think about that. You know, just coming to God and saying, God, you know all about me. How good I am, how great I am. He didn't realize all I've seen and come short of the glory of God. 
He did not understand by the works of our righteousness, filthy us. We cannot bring ourselves into a relationship with God. He did not understand by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. He did not understand that we need the lamp of God, the blood of the lamb to cleanse us and wash us and make us acceptable in the sight of the Lord. He thought by himself, by his good works, by his religious duties, he could make himself acceptable unto the Lord. Have you interacted with some of the people that specialize in fasting? And they fast and fast and fast. And then they come to tell you, say, you know, hey, you deeper life hey, people, you don't understand. All you have is doctrine. All you have is just Bible. All you have is just teaching. But you know, we fast and fast. And then if you want to say, well, we don't, uh, we don't want to publicize our fasting. Uh, why don't you want to publicize your fasting for me? I'll tell you what I do. For example, you know, I just finished a 21 days fasting. Not ordinary. No food, no water. And you see how strong I am. That's boasting. That's pride. That fasting is useless. That fast completely useless. You're not going to get anything from God. The Lord said, don't make it appear unto men. As if you're fasting. You know some people, even here, prayer warriors. You know, they belong to the prayer warriors and they're praying. And then they go to someone and they say, well, this is your problem that you have. All right, I'll pray for you. Because you, I'm a member of the prayer warriors. And I tell you, I just finished the seven days fasting. Because, you know, it's part of my life now. Every month, I must fast this number of days. If we know you will get you out of that prayer warriors. Because God will not answer your prayer. You're a Pharisee. A religious fellow. That's what the Pharisee did. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of what that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. But smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me. Sin, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. That is, that Pharisee had nothing of the Lord. The hypocrites stain every good thing they try to do was sin. The sin of seeking the praise of men. Their righteousness, their arms giving, their praying, their fasting, like the Pharisees are all done to be seen of men. That is, to attract attention to their supposed spirituality. All their works, Jesus said, they do to be seen of men. That's Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. The heart of the sinner, the heart of the backslider, the heart of the hypocrite is so depraved that what is meant to lead to humility, humiliation before God is turned to a means of pride and self exaltation before men. Hypocrites today, like the Pharisees of old, they advertise their fasting. Advertise their fasting. And you know, sometimes you're even reading the newspapers, and here comes, you know, this man is a great man of God. That's what they say. But in sight of God, it's not a great man, it's not even a man of God at all. And then he says, he writes in the newspapers for the whole nation to read. Send in your prayer request. I just came out of 40 days fasting. And I want to go into another period of uh, prolonged fasting. So if you have any problem, just uh, you know, send uh, your prayer request. And of course, when you send a prayer request, I hope you also understand that you need to take care of the prophet of God. And your donation will be gratefully received. That's a trader. That's a market man. He cannot, he cannot do farming. He cannot do any other kind of work. All he has to do is, you know, religious a kind of, uh, of activity so as to get money. I hope you don't send any prayer requests to that uh, kind of place. I said, I hope you don't send your prayer requests to that kind of place. Hey, those are not Christian people. Those are just people that want to make merchandise of others. But you see, it says when you fast, you must not be like that. Those hypocrites, they advertise their fasting. And they make public what should have been kept secret between their souls and God. They manifest a political ex expression or superficial religion to give a false impression of their spirituality. The Lord has warned us against a in fasting, against a in every other thing that we do. 
We are to do all things for God's glory, not for the promotion of self. The fasting of hypocrites whose main ambition, main purpose, and main goal is, uh, is to attract attention to themselves or to have the praise of men is abomination in the sight of the Lord. That's what the Lord said in Luke chapter 16. Open your Bible, underline this in your Bible. Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye of them, we, ye are they which justify yourselves before men but god knows your hearts when you publicize god knows your hearts when you advertise god knows your hearts and then it says in verse 15 for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of god abomination in the sight of god zechariah in Zechariah chapter 7, we're looking at it from verse 4. Zechariah chapter 7, looking at verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land, and to, and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the feast on the seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? They fasted for forty years, and they kept it very regular. Those stated most stipulated times of fasting. And the Lord said, Do you think I counted that as unto me? And when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did ye eat, if, uh, ye did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Ye should not, uh, ye, should ye not hear the words the, which the Lord has cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? And the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain. And now he said something to them, even though they were fasting. But because they didn't fast in the right way. See what he said in verse 12. Yea, they make their hearts as an adamant stone, incorrigible. But they fasted. That's what happens to many people. They fast, but are incorrigible. Their lives are still as dirty as ever. And it seems that the Lord has a controversy with them on. They will not correct those things. And yet they keep on fasting. It says here, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of us has sent in the spirit by the former prophets. They have, uh, therefore uh, came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear. So they cried and I will not hear says the Lord of hosts. I pray we'll hear the word of God will be obedient to the word of God and then our fasting will be meaningful and God will answer our prayers in Jesus name we're looking at point number three now and it's the power of proper fasting the power of proper fasting when we fast and we fast in the right way in the proper way what will the Lord do well a lot of things let's come back to Matthew chapter 6 Matthew chapter 6 we're looking at verse 17 and verse 18 but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face. You wash, you clean up yourself, you observe the normal cleanliness and hygiene. And then it says in verse 18, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which seeth in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee how? I said how? Openly. But remember, you have to do it properly, not fasting. Let's show you some examples. We've, some, we've seen some examples already. Let's show you a little bit more. First Samuel chapter 7. In First Samuel chapter 7, we're looking at verse 3. And we're looking at it until verse 6. First Samuel chapter 7 verse 3 And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel Saying If you do return unto the Lord With all your hearts Then put away the strange gods And Astaroth from among you And prepare Your hearts unto the Lord And serve him only 
And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. You see what Samuel told the people. This, this is the true prophet of God. Telling the people what they ought to do. How their lives ought to be. And what their relationship ought to be unto the Lord. What their commitment, consecration, devotion ought to be unto the Lord. Have you noticed what he said? If you return unto the Lord, you return with all your heart. It demands you love him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, all your strength. Therefore, you, you return with all your heart. And then he says, you put away strange gods and asteroids. And as I talk to you as a deeper life, a family, what the Lord is telling us is this. All those, uh, you know, books of erroneous prayer, praying to destroy enemies. And praying to get this done, to get that done. And you know, those things are not according to the word of God. The Lord is saying, throw those things away. All the books are telling you that, you know, they were in secret cults, they were this, and then they are revealing some deep things of territorial spirit and that spirit and all that. And I tell you stories about when they used to be in all those evil things, and then you are knowing the depths of Satan, as they say, throw them away. The Lord is saying, it's not in that. And he's saying that you, you will separate yourself from everything that has pollution, everything that has idolatry, everything that has occultism. And it's when you do that, he says, now you want to pray and fast, so come before the Lord, and the Lord will answer your prayer. And then it says, in that same verse, he says, prepare your hearts unto the Lord. You prepare your heart. If there's any guilt, any condemnation, if there's any uncleanness, so wash everything away in the blood of the Lamb. And then it says that you serve him only. You serve him only. Not God and mammon. Not God and idols, not God and ancestors, not God and self, but you serve him only. And it is when you come to God like that, then if you fast and pray, the Lord will answer your prayer. Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. They served the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mispeh. And I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mispe and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. And fasted on that day. And fasted on that day. But please remember what they had done before that fasting. Remember how they had kind of thrown away all those idols before that fasting. Remember that now they came in consecration, devotion, dedication to the Lord. To serve the Lord only before that fasting. It says in that verse 6, And they gathered together to Mispe and drew water and poured each out before the Lord. And they fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mispe. And when the Philistines said that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mispe. And the, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel had it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said unto Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel and the Lord heard him and the Lord heard him the Lord will hear you and Sam and as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them and they were smitten before Israel and the men of Israel went out of Mispe and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came unto Bethka and then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mispe and Shen and called Called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto as the Lord helped us, the Lord will help you. Yeah. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. Jonah chapter 3. You know the story? Jonah had come to Nineveh. And as he came to Nineveh, he told them the Lord was not happy with them. His message was very brief and very short. His message was very clear and very plain. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then we're told in Jonah chapter 3 verse 5. So the people of Nineveh be believed God and proclaimed a fast. They believed God and proclaimed a fast. They didn't just proclaim a fast. 
they believed God. You know, that's the emphasis we're making tonight. That together with the fasting, we must believe the word of God. And believe the word of the prophet. And believe the word of the teacher of the word of God. And it is that conscious dependence upon the word. Acceptance of the word of God. That gives us assurance the Lord will answer our prayers when we pray. It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth uh, from, uh, from the greatest of them even to the least. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and such in ashes. Once again, I cannot pass over this without telling you kings. If the kings are going to be saved, there is only one way of salvation, repentance and faith in Christ. If the chiefs in this land, if they are going to be saved, there is only one way of salvation, faith in Christ, repentance and faith in Christ. But if you, you know, if we are programs, and then we invite all these kings and all these chiefs with all the idolatrous chains and things on them and the idolatrous cap on them, I was so happy and so grateful. See, in our church, the kings and the chiefs are coming. And with all their polygamy, all their idolatry, and we don't tell them what the word of God says. That's no Christianity. But you see the king here, he did not mind the approach of Jonah. Jonah did not have, you know, a kind of good uh, communication ability. Just said 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the king had that. We don't have to compromise the word of God, the way of salvation. If we want the kings to be saved, the chiefs to be saved, the directors and the managers and the people high in society, if we want them to be saved, it's still the same word. There's only one way of salvation. And uh, here we are told the king then, and uh, this is what he did. He put his robe aside and he covered himself with sackcloth and he sat on ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Let them fast. But once again, let's understand, it's not just bare fasting without repentance, without dealing with sin. Look at verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every, every one from his evil way. You understand? Let everyone turn from his evil way. Let everyone turn from his evil way. It's then the fasting will mean something. And it's then God Almighty will take note of the fasting. And then he tells us in verse 8, that verse 8, and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away is, uh, from his fierce anger that will perish not. And God saw their works that he turned from their evil way. Not just the fasting, the repentance too. And God saw their deeds, he saw their works, he saw their attitude, he saw their turning around, he saw that he turned from the evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. We're, we're asking that God will bring revival. We're praying that God will bring revival. A revival of repentance. A revival of righteousness. A revival of holiness. The people will turn away from their sins. And I pray it will start with you. It will start with me in Jesus name. Before we close. Let us look at jo Joel chapter 2. There's proper fasting. There's improper fasting. Proper fasting where the prayer of faith is mighty. And powerful in its awesome effect. The believer is yet to see the awesome power of faith, prayer, and fasting. What seems impossible in the affairs of men becomes possible. And extraordinary things will happen as God responds to the prayer and the fasting of the people of God, of the righteous. Personal problems are solved if we pray right and fast 
and fast aright. Powerful enemies will be conquered. If we pray aright and fast aright, imminent judgment will be averted, like in the case of Nineveh. If we pray aright and fast aright, and yokes will be broken, curses will be broken and destroyed. If we fast in the appointed way, and families and cities and even nations will be delivered, and demons and evil spirits will be cast out, and their captives will be set free. If we pray the way God has instructed us to pray, and the way Christ has been teaching us in this sermon on the mount to pray, expect the expectations of the wicked will be disappointed, and miracles, miracles, miracles will happen. The Holy Ghost will move in extraordinary ways, and mighty revivals will come with great harvests of souls. If we will pray and fast in God's appointed way, the Lord has taught us we're going to do it. I said we're going to do it. And the Lord wants us to correct all the erroneous things we had before in the area of fasting. In these last days, as we face the overwhelming challenges, individual believers and families and groups of believers together, it's time to wait upon the Lord and to fast and to call upon them and say, Lord, we're calling upon you so that great miraculous things will be done in Jesus' name. And let's look at this. this is how we tap the power of the Lord in our lives. The power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And I pray it will begin to happen to us. Joel chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12. Joel chapter 2 verse 12. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. And with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of, of the evil, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing and behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, set apart a fast. Dedicate a fast, proclaim a fast, and call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck breasts. Let the bridegroom come forth, go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach. And the heathen, that the heathen rule, shall rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Here the Lord is saying, Sanctify first, proclaim it first, and wait upon the Lord and then begin to pray so that the power of God like those days of old will come again it will come in Jesus name then the Lord will be jealous for his land and pity his people yea the Lord will answer and say unto his people behold I will send you corn and wine and oil and ye shall be satisfied therewith and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen it says if you fast according to how he has taught us if you, if you will seek the face of the Lord and wait upon the Lord as the Lord has directed in his word no hypocrisy and no pride and no sin and no secret evil that you entertain in your heart and you come and you depend upon the Lord trusting the promises of the Lord it says this is what he will do so that the unbelievers once again they will know that God reigns in the midst of his people but I will remove far off from you the northern army I will drive him into a land that is barren and into the desolate and then he says with his face uh, toward the east the, the east sea and his inner part toward the uttermost uh, sea and his sting shall come up and the seal save shall come up because he has done great things fear not O land if you will pray and fast the way he has taught and the way he has directed and the way he has put everything to us and you make sure that you deal with sin and you embrace and appreciate holiness and righteousness and then you come with faith in the presence of the Lord he says there's nothing to fear fear not O land be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do great things. Amen. Amen. The Lord will do great things. You know, the Lord is just telling you that if you'll abandon the ways of evil, 
And then you'll embrace the way of the Lord. And you pray and you fast the way he's teaching us in the word. And then all those, uh, all those other religious things we've been in the past, uh, we kind of reject everything. Time of revival has now come. Be not afraid, ye bees of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth the fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately, and it will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the flood shall be full of wheat. And the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. My great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty. And shall be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And I tell us the revival, about the revival, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. If you will seek the face of the Lord, if you will embrace the word of the Lord, if the righteous standard of God becomes very important to you, and then you want to live like the Lord is directing us to live. Having his grace, the fullness of grace to live the way he wants us to live. And then you pray and fast according to the teaching of his word. Not following the examples of the religious people of the day. It says a revival of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost will come. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams dreams and your young men shall see visions and also upon the upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days i will pour out my spirit i need a good amen yeah. and then in verse 32 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved whosoever shall call on the name of the lord revival of salvation people coming and then repenting turning away from sin calling upon the name of the lord and being saved and then it says they'll be delivered and then in that in mount zion and jerusalem shall be deliverance and as the lord has said and then it says and in the remnant whom the lord shall call the Lord has taught us about uh, praying and fasting today and we need to take it to heart and do what the Lord has instructed us to do and I pray that mountains will move away in our lives in Jesus name in Matthew chapter 17 I'm reading from verse 19 Matthew chapter 17 verse 19 then the disciples said then then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said why could we not cast him out a challenge they had and then they said, why couldn't we cast out that demon, that evil spirit? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, it's time for mountains to move away from us, for the problems to be solved. For the great things we have been expecting to come, to come unto us, it will come in Jesus' name. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, he shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. For the day to come, for the hour to come, and for the moment to come in our church, when every mountain is moved away, every demon is cast out, Every sickness is healed. Every challenge is addressed. And every problem solved. That day can come. If we we'll unite together in humility and holiness and seek the face of the Lord. It says nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it this kind goeth not out but by. But by. Or by prayer and fasting let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer and say lord we've had your words today 
and your word that we have heard, we are going to take it to heart. If we have been doing it the wrong way, we now want to do it the right way. Stand up, I said. Those in the front, stand up. Obedience is so important. Now we are correcting things in our lives. They ought to be well corrected. And we open our mouths and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, we have heard your word. And we are going to take your word to heart. We are going to follow through. So that that time of revival will come. Seek the face of the Lord. Turn away from everything that is evil. And present your heart, your soul, your mind to the Lord. Come in to serve the Lord with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And say, Lord, I'm going to follow through till the end. No compromise, no sin, no backsliding, no evil, no bad habit, no occultism, no iniquity, no evil. No disobedience. Who listens unto the Lord? That's what makes prayer and fasting powerful. If hypocrisy has strayed in your praying to your praying and fasting, get rid of that hypocrisy. Where well, you need to repent, repent. Where well, you need to make restitution, make restitution. Where well, you need to have anything changed. Anything turned around, any apology, do it. Let the Lord see that you are sincere. You want to sincerely follow the Lord and sincerely live a life that is bringing glory to the Lord. And then the fasting become meaningful. Powerful, purposeful, acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Don't fast as the hypocrites fast. Don't fast as all these religious people of the day, of our day, how they are fasting. Advertising the fasting, publicizing the fasting. All the pride. And the seeking of the praise of men. Let's drop all that. Let's seek the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, when ye fast. Have you ever fasted? When ye fast. There are mountains to move away. Even if it's for a day. When ye fast. Problems to solve. When ye fast. Spiritual power, authority to receive when ye fast. A great revival, revival of holiness in the church when ye fast. Captives to deliver when ye fast. Afflictions to be taken away. Oppressions to be taken away. When ye fast. The 
the Lord expects there will be time in your life when you'll fast. A day or two. Before you go on protracted fasting, you must be specially led of the Lord. Specially inspired, directed by the Lord if it's going to be protracted. And yet you must keep it between you and the Lord. Not something to brag about. Not something to be proud about. Not something to advertise. Tell the Lord you need a revival in your soul, revival in your spirit, revival in your life. It's going to demand dedication to the Lord, consecration to the Lord, absolute surrender to the Lord, complete yieldedness to the Lord. If you're going to see any revival, if you want extraordinary things to be, to be done in your life, spiritually, in the family too. The Lord will answer. It's looking at your heart. It's listening to your prayer. Have faith in God. Fasting without faith will not achieve anything. Have faith in God. Let the fasting be according to the teaching of the word of God. Have faith in God. With obedience to the word of God. With obedience to the word of God. That will make that's what will make your prayers to be answered. Be not as the hypocrites are. Wash your face, anoint your head. That you will not appear unto a mental fast, but unto your Father who is in heaven. And your Father, which seeth in secret, he will reward you openly.